Hello there, ladies and gentlemen of Burlington Day School, 8th grade, Algebra 1. Welcome to the last section in Chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be talking about logical reasoning today. This is a section that a lot of people say, oh, you're not really doing math, you're just reading sentences. Well, yes, we're just reading sentences, but the thought process that goes into logical reasoning is the very basis of all the equations in mathematics that you typically think of. All right. I can also promise you that if you skim over this chapter or this section and don't think about it too much and just blow it off, you are going to die next year in geometry. The first two to three chapters in geometry next year are going to be all about logical reasoning. And you'll do things called truth tables and deciding if stuff is uh, logical or not. Okay. So please, please follow this especially the second half of this section about determining validity of a statement, um, is going to make next year a heck of a lot easier if you put forth the effort this year. All right, so let's get into it. Logic statements are statements that are made up of two different parts. We have a hypothesis, something that we decide is going to happen, and a conclusion, something that's going to happen because of the hypothesis. Okay? In a math logical statement or a conditional statement, the hypothesis says this is happening. The conclusion says this will happen because of the hypothesis. Okay? Another term for logical reasoning, conditional statements, uh, more commonly referred to as if-then statements. Okay? An if-then statement. You can imagine it's called an if-then statement because it has two parts, an if and a then. All right, the hypothesis follows the if of the statement. That means the conclusion is what follows the word then. Okay? So we have our hypothesis, which is if something. The conclusion is then this. If so and so happens, then this will happen. All right? So let's take a look at a couple examples of what an if then statement or a conditional statement is going to look like. If they are both free, then Dustin and Kaysen will go to the golf course. If is right here, then our conclusion down here. Okay? So the hypothesis is they are both free. We're assuming that Dustin and Kaysen are both free. They have nothing else to do. Okay? If that's true, then Dustin and Kaysen will go to the golf course. That's the conclusion we draw. Assume that Dustin and Kaysen are true, then we'll predict that they're going to go to the golf course. Okay. Second part, if Lane runs for student council president, then the school will descend into anarchy. Okay. Again, we're going to assume the first part's true. We're assuming Lane's running for student council president. The conclusion, if Lane runs for student council president, is that the school will descend into anarchy, which most of you would probably agree is a pretty fair statement. There's not much you can do to prove that one false. Sorry, Lane. Okay, now this is the part that's going to be a little trickier that you're going to have to think about and it's going to help you much more next year uh, when we, you spend a lot of time on logic statements and deductive reasoning and determining validity, truth tables, things like that. Okay, you need to know what a counterexample is. Okay? A counterexample is just an example or a statement of something that proves the if then statement false. So if we're looking up at this previous two, if I wanted to come up with a counterexample for A, okay, my counterexample to prove that statement false would be every time Dustin and Kaysen are free, they don't go play golf. They probably do it a lot. But sometimes they're both free. They might play Call of Duty. Okay. Dustin and Kaysen playing Call of Duty would be a counterexample showing that one's false. Okay. 
I don't think there's a counterexample for uh, Part B because the school would descend into anarchy if Lane ran for student council president. So let's take a look at example two now. Provide the counterexample for the following statements. If Quentin is using his computer, then he is playing Minecraft. Okay. A counterexample for that. What else could Quentin be doing? He's not, he's not playing Minecraft every single time he's on his computer, maybe most of the time, but he's not doing it every time. He could be doing lots of things. He could be watching something on Netflix. He could be watching YouTube videos. Okay. He does lots of stuff, videos. He has lots of stuff on his computer besides play Minecraft. Okay, any one of those things would be a counterexample. All right. Part B, if I'm standing in the rain, then I will get wet. Is it every single time I'm in the rain, am I going to get wet? No. Uh, maybe if I'm under an umbrella. If I'm under an umbrella, I'm not going to get wet. Or maybe I'm wearing a raincoat. Okay, So just because I'm in the rain doesn't mean I'm going to get wet. Those would both be counterexamples for that statement. And our last one, if x times y equals 1, then x or y must equal 1. Okay, What's that say? What, what that is saying is I have two numbers multiplied together that equal 1, x and y. That means one of those two has to be one, is what that statement's saying. Is that true? Well, we can think about a couple things. And if you were paying attention in section one, you should already know what the answer to the, what this counterexample is going to be. Okay? The only way that I can multiply two numbers together and get one is if A, they're both one, if x equals one, and y equals 1, 1 times 1 is 1. Okay, So in that case, it's true. But is there another way to get 1 besides x and y equaling 1? Well, if I made x equal 3 and y equal 1, is 3 times 1, 1? No. Okay. So let's think back to section 1 where we had our properties. We had a specific property that told us when two numbers being multiplied would equal 1. And if we think about the multiplicative inverse property, the counterexample for part C could be any number of things, but you could say x equals 1 half and y equals 2 over 1. If x is 1 half and y is 2 over 1, you multiply those together and get 1. So right here is our counterexample. That proves the statement false. Because x is 1 half, y is 2, neither of them are 1. When you multiply them together, you get 1. Okay? So this is the last section in Chapter 1. Uh, make sure we get the homework on this done. Get ready for the quiz. And uh, we'll see you in class. Bye.